I think I'm the only academic speaking here at, at the conference. Uh, so I want to actually talk to you, though, uh, about a real database, new database system we're building at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and we're actually spending the time to do what I consider high quality engineering within academia to put the system out there and have it actually be usable outside of our research group. And so the system is called Peloton, and we're pitching this, or what's making this system different from what's already out there is that this is the first self-driving database management system. So I'll explain what that is in, in a second, but before I talk about uh, the new system, I want to spend a little time talking about how I got to the point to where we're now studying or researching this particular problem. So uh, my background is when I was in graduate school, I helped build a new database management system called HStore. Um, if you've never heard of HStore, that's fine, right? It's, there's a Wikipedia article that I wrote, but it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, but you may have actually heard of VoltDB. And so HStore is actually the academic predecessor of VoltDB. So they took our code, they forked it, and they formed the company, uh, Volt. And so HStore and VoltDB are database management systems that are designed for high throughput transaction processing. And that's what they were desi designed to do above everything else. So they didn't care about doing OLAP. They didn't care about doing more complex analytics. It was purely trying to get fast transactional performance. And it's probably the best systems out there now that can do this. So what happened, though, because we had this incessant drive to just get better and better OLTP performance, I got in a little bit of trouble because I ended up getting addicted to trying to get high transaction throughput. And I, to the detriment of my health, my relationships, and my family, uh, I did this over, you know, I, I worried about this research problem with, you know, in, in lieu of everything else. So now that I've gone through rehab and now that I've sort of talked it over with my sponsor, I'm actually going to share with you guys the experience that I had of how we, you know, I got in trouble with these systems. So it all started in uh, 2008 when we had the first demo of HStore. Um, and this is actually me and one of the first uh, engineers at VoltDB uh, showing our, our, what our system could do at VODB in New Zealand. And so for this initial prototype of the system, we could do 5,000 transactions a second on about two laptops. Now, by today's standard, this doesn't seem like much, but you have to understand at the time, the best that MySQL and Postgres could do for TPCC was maybe 400, 500 transactions a second. And then a well-tuned Oracle box could do about 900 whereas we were a bunch of academics and we were able to write a system that could do 5,000. So I'll never forget when we turned the system on the first time, that feeling that I got, this rush that came over my body when I saw the performance numbers we, we, we were able to achieve. And so I wanted to get that same high over and over again, right? So I just kept trying to make my system better and better to try to get this number and get that same feeling I had the first time. So in 2010, we had a later prototype of the system where we were able to do 11,000 transactions a second. Um, and so people started to notice that I started having problems. I was very obsessed about getting you know, higher throughput numbers. And this is actually a picture of me hiding in the bathroom from my advisor, because they tried to have an intervention to say, hey, maybe you have a problem. Um, and so I was able to avoid that. Then in 2012, uh, we had another version of the system came out where we can do now 50,000 TPCC transactions per second. Uh, and again, at this point, I was a train wreck. I stopped showering. I barely ate. This photo is me. Uh, this photo was taken by my ex-girlfriend when she was trying to wake me up to go, you know, go do something after spending the last three days just trying to get better transaction performance. Um, and again, no matter what I did, no matter how much how much we tried to optimize the system, I never got that same feeling that I had from the first time. And so, sadly, I can admit that I hit rock bottom in 2015 uh, when we had a new prototype system that can now do four million TPCC transactions a second. And so this is the photo of, that the cops took when they picked me up uh, down by the dumpster. Um, like I said, I was completely out of it. So I went through rehab, uh, and you know what? And now I feel like I'm strong enough to say that, yes, I did have a problem. I was addicted to transaction performance. And after working through uh, you know, our, our counselor and everything, I've now realized that just trying to get better transaction performance over everything else ultimately leads to an unfulfilling lifestyle. Because no matter what you do, there's always something else you can do to make, make the system go faster. Right? There's, you can always try to get an extra 100,000 transactions a second. And there's always new hardware coming out that's going to make things go faster. And now what I realize is that this is the only thing that I focus on. I, it's like chasing the pink dragon. You're just never going to get it because it keeps going farther and farther away. And so now, uh, when I went through rehab, I now recognize that I should look at uh, other, other, other problems to try to help the world in other ways. So when I got out of rehab last year, it was right around the time that 
it came, there was this announcement where Apple uh, had purchased a, a database company called Foundation DB. Um, and if you don't, you don't remember what Foundation DB was, they were a NoSQL distributed key value store, sort of similar to what the cockroach guys are we talked about today. Um, and so this is kind of a big deal because Apple bought a database company, and then they, it was it was closed source to begin with, and so they sort of made it more secretive because they didn't talk about what they were actually doing. So the fact that Apple bought this uh, transaction company it, or, or transactional database company isn't that interesting. From my perspective, what was actually really more interesting are the Hacker News comments where people were saying, lamenting the fact that there was no good open source transactional database system that could replace Foundation DB. Now, this is well before I think uh, Cockroach came along. Um, but people are saying, look, the best you can do now is basically shard MySQL Postgres yourself, um, but that's kind of a pain to do. And then the other thing that I saw was there was a lot of comments where people were saying, lamenting the fact that maintaining database software was really expensive and difficult to do. So this particular person is saying the, uh, the enterprise DB guys, so the commercial vendor or the commercial uh, support company for Postgres, wouldn't even talk to them uh, unless they put down $10,000 for a contract to basic, do, you know, da basic database administration stuff on their cluster. So this is sort of the problem that I foresee, that, that there's all these people that are paying a lot of money to have people basically maintain their database software. And maybe sometimes you have somebody on, somebody on staff who's a DBA that has experience through this, but often the case, it falls on someone who actually you know, is, a, is a developer, but maybe used the database at their last job, and so they can maybe know something about how to, how to tune the system and make it actually work. And so part of the problem of all this is that simply database administrators are very expensive. So according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, as of last year, a mid-level to senior database administrator, or DBA, uh, salary was about $81,000 a year. And this is across the entire country. I know for a fact that in talking with DBAs here in New York City, they're making well over six figures, right? And especially in some of the financial firms, these things can range up to about $500,000 a year. And when you think about it, what the database administrator is doing, you're basically paying somebody to babysit software, right? They're checking to see what indexes are there, they're checking to see whether the system's running correctly. They're just a human being checking to make sure this really expensive software that holds all your data is working as expected. And so this is the problem we're trying to solve with the self-driving database manager system, is that we are gonna develop a new system that's able to do all the things that a human DBA can do now automatically. So that means we're gonna be able to configure, tune, and optimize the system without requiring a human to make any decision about whether those, you know, w w whether those are the right choices to make. And so the kind of things that we think our self-driving database system can support are the sort of classic problems, the classic things that, again, human DBAs are doing now. So things like physical database design, picking indexes, picking materialized views, uh, partitioning data, um, data placement, so moving data between different nodes to balance things out, Query optimization, sort of when a query runs slow, figuring out why it went slow and, and make decisions on how to speed things up. Knob configuration would be sort of, sort of setting buffer pool sizes and cache sizes, backup and recovery, and provisioning. So now, the things that we think a self-driving database management system can't do are anything that requires a human to make a value judgment about the choice. So anything, for example, like with security and ACLs, we're not gonna be able to do because the system's not gonna be able to infer from the application what's the correct thing to do. So for example, if Wesley gets fired from his company on Friday, the database system is not gonna know that come Monday, he shouldn't have access to it, right? This is a, something a human has to tell us. So the, the things on, the, on the, this side here under no, these are things you still need to pay a DBA to do, because this involves getting decisions within the company at a human resource level. But anything from a technical standpoint, in terms of optimizing the database system, we think our new system can handle that. So now you may be thinking, well, haven't I heard this already? Isn't this sort of the basic story of database systems from the 1970s, right? And the whole pitch about using a declarative language like SQL was that we wanted to prevent uh, programmers from having to write joint algorithms by hand, and we'll let the database system have an optimizer pick the correct query plan to do. So I would, and certainly in the last 15 or 20 years, Microsoft did a lot of stuff in, with the auto admin project of coming up with sort of index advisory tools and other things like that. And of course, Oracle and IBM sell similar products. So what I would say what's different about what we're doing now versus what's, what's already been done is all those previous tools are all reactive and human driven. So what usually happens is you, the, for the index stuff, or the index advisory tools, the DBA has to prepare a workload trace of here's all the queries that I've run in the past and here's the ones that ran slow. You feed that into the tool and the tool comes back and says, well, here's the indexes I think you need to add. And then it's still up to the human to decide 
not only whether to apply the, the suggestions and make the changes to the database, but also to know when to do that. Right? For example, the DBAs know that Sunday at 3 a.m. is when your application doesn't see a lot of traffic, so that's when you can go ahead and build indexes. So in our self-driving database system, not only do we have to be able to make the same optimization choices that the current tools can do, but we also have to, to predict what's coming down the pipeline for the application and to know what we need to prepare ourselves for, but then also to infer from the workload we've seen in the past when's the right time to apply these optimizations. So again, using the Sunday, Sunday morning example. So the reason why this is now possible is that there's been enough recent advancements in both the storage and computational hardware as well as algorithmic advancements with deep learning where we can actually apply a lot of the techniques that our people are using today for self-driving cars and use them within the self-driving database system. So things like the GPUs and larger memory capacities that allow us to store more data and process it to build models for what our application is going to do. So the system that we're, we're building to try out this idea is called Peloton. So if you're not familiar with pe the term Peloton, it's a French word that means uh, platoon. And it basically has to do when you have bicyclists racing in like an Olympic game, they pack together as they go around the velodrome so they reduce the wind resistance for everyone. So this is the basic, basic idea we want to do in our database system. We want to have the system use multiple nodes, work together to make the system overall, uh, the overall system work faster. So as I said, we're trying to make the system be usable outside of CMU. So this is Apache licensed, open source. Uh, we speak, the, we try to be Postgres compatible. And we're spending the time to actually you know, do, write the things you would actually need to do to run this in production and not just be sort of a research prototype that we need to write papers. So there's sort of four main tenets or pillars of the Peloton project that I, I want to talk about a little bit, um, but I'll focus on the autonomous piece at the end. So the first is that Peloton uses an in-memory architecture. So that means that the primary storage, location, primary storage location of the database is assumed to be entirely in DRAM. So if you make this choice, it allows you to optimize a bunch of different aspects of the system, like its concurrent control scheme and logging scheme, that you would not be able to do in a traditional disk-based system like in Postgres or MySQL or Oracle. So now there's a whole other avenue of research we're doing in this as well, where we're, we're building the system to be able to take advantage of the new emerging non-volatile memory technologies that are coming out there. It's like memristors and phase change memory, those things like that. Um, so we have papers on that uh, if, you're, if you're interested. But basically what I'll say is that we're designing the system in such a way that when this MVM stuff finally becomes available, you can plop it in the system and, and we'll be able, to, be able to use it automatically to extend the address space of, of the database or the database process. Right? And the things like with Postgres and MySQL and Oracle, you're not going to be able to do that very easily because they, you know, they are assuming they're using slow, base, slow disk systems or SSDs. So the other aspect of our system that's relevant is that we're designing this thing to be a, a, a hybrid system or HTAP system. So that means that within the single, single database instance, you can run all the fast transactions you would have run in like a VoltDB style system, as well as do all the analytics that you'd want to do in like a Spark, a Greenplum, a Vertica, or a Redshift system. And so you can, we can do this in such a way where the analytical operations don't slow down the transactions from updating the database. So it allows you to not, not have to worry about using ETL process to shove all the data from your front end transactional database to your back end uh, data warehouse. You can do everything in, in a single box. The next piece that's relevant to us uh, is that we have an execution engine that's using the LLVM to do query compilation. It is my opinion that if, any, any, if you ever have a data warehouse, you have to do code generation or query compilation to get the good performance. And so we, we use the LLVM to make this possible. The only other two systems that we know about that do the similar, uh, that also use the LLVM to do this would be MemSQL and uh, the German hyper system that Tableau bought last year. So what this allows you to do, instead of generating a query plan tree like you would do if you ever took an intro introduction to database course and, and then have to traverse and interpret the tree, you basically compile the query into machine code and execute it directly. And in some cases, you can get 100x speed up over the sort of traditional model. And then the last piece is this autonomous stuff that I'll focus on for the, for the rest of the talk. Uh, so what I'll say is that for all the other things, the LLVM, the, the hybrid stuff, and the in-memory stuff, these are necessary for us to be able to do the, the autonomous stuff that, that, that I'm going to talk about next. Because if you have a slow disk-based system like a MySQL or a Postgres or an Oracle, then you essentially have an 18-wheeler that is not going to be able to, to be very nimble and agile and make changes quickly based on what the database system is observing in your application. And so only because we have these other parts is going to make this autonomous stuff possible. So the core thing that we're building to do the self-driving uh, control of the system is what we're essentially calling the brain. So we originally wanted to call the system, the entire system, the brain. 
but obviously Google Brain would, would interfere with that and be difficult to find us on a search engine. So the Brain is essentially the, is an integrated deep learning framework that's embedded inside the database system that monitors the workload of the queries that your application executes and then builds models based on what it sees and then uh, runs an optimization algorithm to figure out what actions it wants to take to uh, improve the, the, the latency or the throughput of the system. And so I want to go sort of high level overview how this works and I'll show a, uh, some, some, some res experimental results to showing you what, what we can do with this. So the database system, the, the brain part is going to be monitoring the, the application's uh, workload, so observing all the queries that it executes. And in the first phase, it's going to use an unsupervised clustering algorithm to break the queries up into buckets uh, based on similar features. So the features could be like what tables did they access, what tables did they modify, um, uh, you know, what kind of query operation they were doing, as well as physical metrics like what, how many rows did they access or how many, tu how many uh, records did they modify. And now for each of these buckets, we're going we're gonna to generate a time series graph that corresponds to the number of queries that occurred for that bucket across different horizons. So in the example I'm showing here, we have a 24-hour, a 7-day, and a 40-day horizon. And the idea here is for the, uh, for the more shorter horizons, like in the 24-hour case, we'll keep, uh, we'll keep intervals that, sh uh, we use more fine-grained intervals to keep track of all the queries that we execute on a per-minute basis. But in the longer-term horizon, like in the 40 days, case, we don't really care about how many queries you expect to execute on a per-minute basis 30 days from now. So we'll use something like on an hourly or, 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 or two-hour basis. So now for each of these time series, we'll feed this into a uh, TensorFlow to build uh, recurrent neural networks, or long-term, long short-term memory recurrent neural networks. So if you don't know anything about deep learning, the only thing you need to know is that there's essentially two types of neural networks. There's the convolution ones, and that's what they use for the, uh, the image recognition. And then there's the recurrent neural networks, and that's the one you use for time series analysis or stock analysis like we're doing here. So we're going to build uh, some, some neural networks for each of our time series. Uh, and that's going to allow us to model and predict what we think the workload is going to look like in the future. And we're going to want to do this for every single bucket that we have. So then now we feed this into the, the, the optimization component where we're going to figure out what actions we want to take to make the database system, database system run faster. So the first part is we have this catalog of all the, these different actions and a history of what happened when we tried to run them before. So it would be a list of all the indexes we could possibly add. And if we ever try to add one, we say, well, when we added it, did it, did it make things better or did it make things worse? And then we're going to feed this into a tree search algorithm, a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, to figure out a sequence of actions that we want to apply for, for our given database state at that moment. And then we have a cost benefit or cost model that allows us to determine for every single action, is this, you know, how long is it going to take for us to deploy it, and what benefit is the database system going to get from it? So at the end of the day, what we want to do is this action sequence of all the actions we want to take uh, from now until some point in the future. And then what we end up doing is we, we end up throwing away all the actions but the first one, only apply it, and then come back and do this whole entire process all over again. So I don't want to force the metaphor too much, but this is essentially what the self-driving cars are doing. The self-driving car looks as far as can, it can down the road and then plans a bunch of action sequence, or plans an action sequence that's going to get it to that end of the horizon. But then what happens is it ends up throwing away all but the first action, applies it, and it comes back and does all this planning over again. So in the terms of reinforcement learning, this is called receding, receding horizon action planning. So this is essentially what we want to do, but we, and unlike the self-driving car, it does it every you know, once, 30 times a second. We, our time frame is a bit longer here. So an action could be like add an index, drop an index, make this change, move data around, but then we would only apply the first one, come back and evaluate whether we, uh, that helped us out or not. And again, we have sort of this, this feedback mechanism for every action that we take. We check to see whether that was a good choice or not. All right, so for, uh, for the evaluation, what I want to show is two parts. I want to show uh, that our forecasting models can actually predict what we think a database workload is going to look like. And then I want to show how uh, we can use this information to automatically optimize the layout of the database. So for this, we don't actually have any customers yet uh, or any real, real users because this, this is still an academic prototype. But for this, we have a synthetic workload that's based on the, uh, some public traffic data from, from Reddit. So we're going to build two RNNs, or two recurrent neural networks, using TensorFlow for this. So the first one, we're going to generate a uh, uh, one-hour horizon at one-minute intervals. 
And so the only thing you need to be mindful of here is that there's the red line is the actual workload, what, what the database system actually executed. And then the blue line is what we predicted would happen. And so if you sort of squint, you can see that we get the major trends correctly, right? And this is pretty good. This is good enough for what we actually need to do for the system to do. So in our case, our error rate is around 15%. And in terms of the, for recurrent neural networks, anything less than 20% is, is good enough for us. And so for this, we're actually using the CPU to do this computation in TensorFlow. So it takes about 25 minutes for us to, to, to build, this, build this model. We just got our new GTX 1080 last week. So hopefully we can run this in the, G, in the GPU and get lower numbers. But the main things that we actually care about is that the probe time and the update time are, are really small. So it only takes us two milliseconds to probe our model and figure out what we think the workload is going to be. And that's pretty fast. And then it only takes us five milliseconds to take a new interval of a new uh, batch of queries that we just executed and do the back propagation in the model to update it to keep us moving forward in time. So in this example here, we're doing uh, one minute intervals. So that means every minute we only have to spend five milliseconds to update the model and always keep it in sync with what the, the database act application is actually doing. So now when we look at a more longer horizon, here we're doing 24 hour horizon with one minute intervals. And again, the same thing, we get the major trends correctly. Uh, and, but our error rate is a little bit higher. We're now about 18%. Um, but the CPU training time is less because there's less data that we're keeping track of on a per, in, per, uh, per interval basis. So the last thing I'll point out, too, is that in both these cases, the neural network is around 2 megabytes in size. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but be, mind, be mindful of the fact that we are an in-memory database. So every, every, any bit of memory you're using for these models takes away from data we can actually store. Uh, and then we also have to keep, keep multiple models for every single bucket that we generate. So we could have potentially too many of these. So this is sort of an area where I think the algorithm stuff, the algorithm work that people are doing in deep learning is going to catch up and help us out here. So for example, there's a bunch of techniques that people are working on now to reduce the, uh, the how much data you're storing on a you know, per weight basis. So these are using like 32-bit or 64-bit weights, but some people are doing some work on six, you know, dropping down to 16-bit weights. There's other techniques you can do to also compress the, the neural network by you know, reducing the number of layers you have by, by uh, just sort of shrinking them. So we think uh, when those things come out, that'll help us out, too. And hopefully TensorFlow just gets them. All right, so now that we have these models, what can we actually do with them? So I want to show you a technique that we've had built inside of our system that allows us to do adaptive storage. So what this means is that we're going to change the, the actual physical layout of the data over time based on how queries are actually going to execute it. So I'll give an example. So say we have, in our simple application, we have two queries. We have an OLTP transactional query that wants to update, update the table. And then we have a OLAP query that wants to compute some kind of aggregate over a large portion of the data. So typically what happens in these sort of hybrid uh, applications is that there's some hot data that all the transactions are, are trying to update and access and in, in the OLTP portion of the workload. And then there's this cold data that is read mostly or read only that the uh, analytical queries are going to operate on. So what happens is when you actually look in the actual queries themselves, you'll see it in the OLTP queries they're usually accessing all of the rector, the columns or the attributes of the table. But in OLAP queries, they typically access some subset of them. So what we're going to do, the system is going to categorize our data to be either hot or cold. For now, we're just assuming that it's, a, you know, it's either hot or cold and not sort of a continuous distribution. Uh, but, it, but we could change that without any issues. And then for, each, for the hot and cold data, we'll figure out what's the optimal layout for our table that's going to be get the best performance for the queries that execute on, on these, these segments of the table. So in the case of the hot data, we want to keep everything still as a row store because the queries are accessing all the attributes. And it doesn't make sense to actually split them up. But in the case of the cold data, we want to recognize that the column B and C are used together. So we want to store them uh, uh, contiguously as column segments. And we'll store A and D separately. So this allows you to get the benefit of being a column store because you don't read data that you, you don't have to process data or bring that in to your, to your CPU caches, even though you're actually never going to need them for the query. So this essentially allows us to still get the benefit of having a row store to do fast transactions as you would in like a volt DB or times 10 system, but then also do uh, have a column store that make the analytical queries go faster. So currently, no system can, is actually able to do this automatically in the way that we are. So in the case of MemSQL, the, you can manually declare that a, at a table is either a row store or a column store, and you have to manually move data from one, one segment to the next. So it wasn't do, won't do this automatically. In the case of SAP HANA, the same thing. They actually have two different execution engines and storage engines that will manage the row data and the, store, and, the, and the column data separately. Whereas in our system, it's completely uniform uh, layout, or completely, uh, completely uniform system that can deal with both these types of uh, 
uh, these data formats. So to see what kind of benefit you can get from this, I have a simple micro benchmark where we are going to take the Reddit traffic data we have and sort of model an application where during the daytime we're doing heavy inserts because people are inserting new comments, and then at night we do more decision support or lap type workload where we do complete scans over large portions of the data. And we're going to compare our adaptive layout running in the autonomous, uh, with the autonomous system with a system that has static row layout and static column layout. So in the first case, and so we're going yeah, to divide up our each day into either the scan portion or the insert portion of the workload. So in the case of the row layout, what you see is that the scans keep getting slower as, as more data gets inserted because it's ending, at, ending up having to read more and more data. Right, so this is sort of this is not anything novel. This is not anything new. This has been shown before that column stores will get better performance to do these kind of operations. In the column store case, it's actually reversed. The scans are much faster because it's only reading the data that it actually needs to process the query. But the inserts are slower because you have to take a single tuple and break it up into uh, to the different attributes and do multiple memory memory writes to write out the columns. So the scans actually uh, the inserts are slower than in case of the row store. In the case of our adaptive, adaptive layout system, what we see is that when we start off, we're, we get the same performance as the row store because we just loaded the database in. We didn't execute any queries. So of course, everything was automatically stored as a row uh, in the row, row store format. But then the system recognizes that the, the, the queries that are operating on, the, on particular portions of the table would benefit from having a column store layout. So it automatically migrates or invokes actions that migrate the data from the row store layout to the column store layout. So you as the application, you don't know that this is happening because you're still dealing with a single logical table, a single logical database. But underneath the covers, the database system is managing different physical segments based on what layout is, is, is best for that type of query. And so what you see is, is now is that as the data migrates from, the, from a row layout to a column layout, we can, get, uh, just as, we can get the same performance, if not better, than the pure column store. But when it comes time to insert new tuples, we get the same performance you get in the row store. So again, this is allowing to ha us to have best of, best of both worlds. In a single database system, we can support both types of layouts. And the system is doing this automatically underneath the covers without you as the human having to tell us anything about what your application actually wants. OK, so this all sounds great. And I would love for you guys to you know, try it out in your, in your real applications. But truth be told, we're not actually ready yet. So currently, we, are only, we only support a single node operation. Uh, and we are not actually deploy this in, in production in any meaningful way. But we are very interested in talking with anybody here that actually wants to try this thing out. Uh, and maybe hopefully it can solve some of the problems that you have in your real world applications. And because I talked to enough of you companies to know what you guys actually want, I'm happy to say also to you that everything we're doing is Apache License 2.0. Right? Nothing is proprietary that we're doing. Everything, everything's on GitHub and everything's out in the public. But please do talk to me if you guys actually want to try this out. OK, so I'm actually, uh, the, the website is available online. You can go check out some basic information about what's going on. And again, there's a link to GitHub and a documentation about how we actually do some of these things. And there's papers coming out uh, within the next few months about describing the full architecture in more detail. So I'm obviously not doing this in a vacuum. I have an awesome team back at CMU. Uh, I've made a bunch of students, master's, uh, master's students, PhD students, and postdocs that are helping me build this thing. And again, we're, we're actually spending the time to actually do, you know, good coding or good high quality engineering within academia to make sure this thing doesn't crash and burn when it goes out to the real world. And I actually use this system as the basis for all my projects in my graduate database course on, or graduate course on database internals. So all the students have to do projects uh, that, uh, that, are, that involve our system. So I mean, thank you for your time. I'm happy to any questions about, about the Peloton project. Thank you. Uh, neural network learns something weird and you know takes some action and ends up hurting performance or you know does something disastrous. All right. So his question is, uh, this all sounds fine and dandy, but what happens when the the neural network gets it wrong, right? What do you do? Um, so there is, a, uh, we haven't done this yet, but at some point there there probably will need to be an override switch where if a human does decide that it wants to do something that the data system doesn't want it to do, then the human would take preference over that. But we think that the right way to do this is actually any action that a human specifies would have a TTL, like a time to live. So that way, if it was the correct action, the system would learn that, oh, yes, this is actually what I want to do and keep it. If it's the wrong action, then it can correct it 
and, and, and fix it later on. Another aspect that we haven't quite considered how to support just yet is um, different applications have different performance metrics that, that they care about. And currently, our system cares about reducing late latency of transactions and queries. And the issue with that is the, the kind of benefit or the, the benefit your, your organization or application would get from reducing the latency of an old speed transaction is probably much higher than you get from reducing the latency of an OLAP query. So for example, if your transaction goes from 100 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds, that's a huge win. It allows you to do things maybe you couldn't do before. But if your, if your OLAP query goes from you know, one second to 500 milliseconds, that isn't that big of a deal, right? But in terms of absolute performance, it's a bigger drop than the OLTP case. So the system may end up trying to optimize that, and we don't know how to maybe handle that. Maybe it's a big knob where you say prefer OLTP versus OLAP. The bottom line is we don't want the human app to do any labeling for us to say optimize this, don't optimize that. We hopefully the system can figure all this out. Um, the in terms of, of, of we, we think it's we think that you know this is project that has just started. We think that in the long term, uh, the the neural networks will be good enough that you would never question it, right? It's sort of like the same. I don't again I don't want to force the metaphor too much, but it's sort of like the self-driving car. When they first come out, people are going to be super wary about them, but over the years, as they get vetted and getting better and better and better, then people won't, won't even think about just trusting you know a system or an automated system to take care of everything. That's where I want to end up, but I fully admit we're not there yet. So his question is, uh, it's an in-memory database system. Is there ability to take a snapshot, write it out to disk, and possibly load it back in later? Absolutely. So we, I mean, the standard, we use the standard sort of write-ahead logging approach, where you, 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 write, you, you write out the physical updates to the database to a write-ahead log, and then every so often you take a periodic checkpoint. Right? That's the sort of standard practice in the database system. It's single node, right? Yes. So what would you need to do to make it multi-node? So this question is, what do we need to do? To what do we need to do to make it multi-node? Uh, in terms of the the autonomous stuff or the, the actual full entire entire database system, right? So, so this question is, what do we need to do to make the autonomous stuff distributed? Uh, so, so the thing that we what we when we go distributed, one thing we're considering is that it maybe you dedicate one machine to be the brain brain that controls the entire cluster, and in that case, you need to be able to ship efficiently. Uh, streams to the to that brain about what is actually executing at that particular node, right? And in that case, the the this the only thing that really changes is making sure you keep that thing coordinated and in sync with everybody else, right? So the, so the but the, I don't. It's my impression that the algorithms don't change. You add additional actions to do provisioning and other things that you wouldn't do in a single node case. But I think the overall pipeline that I described with the, the, the traces going to forecasting models or and then you use them in a receding action horizon planning or receding horizon action planning system. I think that all stays the same. Um, do you think what one database brain could learn? I'm sorry, one brain of one instance could learn uh, is transferable to another instance. So his, so his question is: Is it possible to have one database instance uh, train models that could then be transferable to to other models? Uh, we are actually working on another project that's sort of similar to this, and our findings are possibly no. So we have another project where we can take streaming traces, or we take uh, metrics that's collected from the database system, feed that into a model, and then if you come along with your new application that we haven't seen before, we try to map you to an application that we've seen in the past, and since we know how to tune that one, we can help you tune your, your new one. The issue that we're finding, though, is that the, it's very sensitive to the hardware. So if you have, say, uh, you can even have possibly this, the two same database applications just running on different hardware, and you'd make different design choices based on that. So it may not be possible. What we think, would, how this would actually work is that hopefully we can maybe train some basic models at, you know, at CMU that would be provided to you when, you when you use our system. But then for your local system, it gets better and better and better on its own, learning what's going on in its localized environment. So the, the, main, and the main answer is the hardware makes a big difference. And it's hard to extrapolate from that, how to extend it from, you know, from one to next. And that's actually a whole other facet of deep learning. It's called knowledge transfer that is beyond my, what I can do. Yeah. 
Have you explored the avenue of using neural networks to optimize the data model itself as opposed to just slapping indices on tables because that can often improve performance itself? So your question is, could you use a, a, a neural network to optimize the data model? So what do you mean, like, like the relational model or what do you? What do you Oh, so like the, the logical schema. Um, the problem with modifying the logical schema is that it you would have to rewrite the application, right? So, for example, if you take a if you do denormalization de or normalization, you take a table, split it up into two different things, then you have to go rewrite your application to go now do joins. Now you can hide that with a view, uh, but in that case, you're modifying the physical layout. Right, so, you, so it's more maybe maybe your your correct question is not change the logical schema, but change the physical design, and we're absolutely doing that. Right, so we can do decomposition to say, all right, well, this this table can really be broken up to two chunks, and because that because I have a large you know blob field or var binary that maybe want, I want I want to store on the side, and then I have an abstraction layer that knows that it's a it's a single logical table that's now broken up to two different, two different parts. Right, there's no reason we can't do that. We just, for our current version, we don't support that. Do you, do you do anything, so uh, suppose that your system says, oh, you, you know, I think that building this index um, would be a good idea. Do you do anything uh, clever to cut down on the amount of time that it might take to build a thing and test it out? Because, you know, like it might be like an hour to construct an index or something. Right, so your question is, uh, do we do any optimizations to make the index get, build go faster? Mm -hmm. um, so we, it's not published yet. We're actually working on a technique now where we are allowed, we can build our indexes incrementally in a non-blocking fashion. And it's more than just building the index incrementally, and uh, it's actually providing feedback up to the query optimizer to know, hey, there's this index. You can use it uh, if you, you can use it, even though it's partially built, for some queries but not all of them. So the way MySQL and all these systems work now is you build the index, and it can't be used by any query until it's actually done and finished. Where our new proto, our, our new mechanism allows you to build it. And even though it may take an hour, halfway through, you can still actually start using it and speed up queries. But you have to be careful to make sure you don't have any false negatives and false positives. So it's more than just you know, building the index incrementally. It's making the entire stack of the system know that, that that's going on, right? And be aware of that and then make decisions based on, based on that. So um, some of the systems when development time and uh, staging and deploying, the usage pattern and data pattern and query pattern might vary very differently. Like what's the logistics kind of, because you need real data and assume the distribution of data is the same to train the model to make correct decisions. And what's the logistics when like, developers do something which the usage pattern very different from deployment? So your question is, say you run a dev machine to test things out and the, the developers are doing queries in one way with some sample database, and then when you actually run it in production, the, the distribution, the cardinality of values are completely different, and the, and the workload's actually completely different. Again, from our perspective, those, those would be separate database instances, and we, the, 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 you know, the production instance doesn't know about the development one, so it's not gonna make any optimization decisions based on what you did in dev, because it only does what it, what it does in production. Right, and sort of to his sort of related to his question, the developer may come along and say, "Well, when I, in my dev environment, this index really helped. I want to use that." If you tell us you want to create an index, we'll do it, but we'll mark that it was a human made that decision, not us, and then we'll check over time whether that was the right thing or not. A problem that comes up frequently with uh, uh, machine learning, particularly with neural networks, is the difficulty of explaining why a decision was made. Have you guys done any work on the database saying, well, you know, I, that thing that was 100 milliseconds now takes 50, but why? What did I do? Yeah, so his question is, uh, deep learning is awesome. It can be magical sometimes, but it doesn't really tell you why it made the decisions. Absolutely. So we, um, we have thought about this. We haven't done anything yet. This is sort of actually one of the big problems that people have with deep learning now. Is like it's a totally a black box. Stuff comes in, magic comes out, but nobody understands what was going on, right? Because if you actually look at the neural network, it's just a bunch of weights. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, so, I, yes, we have thought about this. I don't want to say anything specific because it's probably going to be incorrect. Uh, ultimately, where we want to go, go is that when we make an action, 
it's going to have a human readable explanation to say like, well, your, your latency was looking like this, and it looked like this in the past, therefore we, we applied this index, so we've done something similar before, and, and, and that's, why, that's why we made that decision. Absolutely, we're not there yet, and I think there's, there's a much more work that needs to be done in deep learning to the algorithm side of things before that's actually possible. But that's a, ma that's a major problem, yes. All right, great. Those are some awesome questions. Um, so we are uh, going to go on coffee break. And just a reminder, Andy's office hours are after coffee break at 3.15 in the room across the way. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>